wood panelling, 128 bytes of RAM and a controller that became an icon. May I present to you the Atari 2600. Hello all and welcome back to the corner. This is going to be a slightly different video today as we look at modifying the Atari 2600 with a universal Atari video board. Don't worry, none of this is permanent and by the end of it, all of it will be reversible. The Atari 2600 is an early 8-bit console released by Atari in the fall of 1977. It has a variant of the MOS 6502 CPU, the MOS 6507, a cost-reduced unit with less address lines and no hardware interrupt support and supporting a max of only 8 kilobytes of address space. It also has the Race the Beam style television interface adapter, or TIA as she likes to be known by. And finally we have the mighty impressive 128 bytes of RAM in this Riot chip. And yes, that's bytes. Not megabytes, not kilobytes, 128 by 8 bits of memory. This sounds ridiculously small, and it is. But back in 1970s, RAM was hecka expensive. In 1976, to get 8K of RAM could cost you $250. That's around $1,149 if using an inflation calculator. The unit I have here is known in the Atari community as the Light Sixer. It has six switches and an entirely plastic case with a wood grain overlay. This is unlike the earlier models which had real wood at the front and a decent heft to them. The console's video and sound output comes from a combined RF cable which carries the video and audio data as if they were broadcast by a TV station in either NTSC or PAL. Oh, and if you were in a Seacam country, then you have my sympathy. Pac-Man in pink and purple, what a sight to behold. You might be wondering why there is no S-Video or even composite outputs on the Atari. And the simple answer is because in the 70s, neither of these standards existed. S-Video didn't exist until the release of the Super VHS in 1987, and composite also only became more common in the 1980s. However, we're now in the 21st century and this archaic standard is either a hassle with modern TVs or just fuzzy. This is where the Universal Atari video board comes in. The UAV is a modern solution designed to take the four original TV signal generation lines from the TIA and turn them into composite and S-video outputs. This makes connecting the Atari 2600 up to any TV or capture device a whole heck of a lot easier and has the added bonus of having a very clean output. It's also stupidly easy to install. First step is to remove the bottom case screws and then separate the case. Then two more screws, the RF cable and a cable connector to remove the switchboard. The switches had these felt washes over them. Over the years these have dried and gone brittle, hence why mine is missing most. I'll have to experiment in the future with replacing these with modern equivalents. And take the magnesium can out of the console. Then it's more skews. Jeez, Atari went all out with the shielding. Before we finally get to the motherboard. It's a very simple and elegant design, consisting of the CPU, the TIA and the Riot or RAM, I.O and timer control chip. The only other IC on the motherboard is the CD4050 which is a non-inverting buffer IC. It's also where the UAV needs to attach to. On the back you'll see the tin plated copper traces in all of its wrinkly glory which is a common technique used at the time. We'll also see the fact that this is a revision B motherboard made in 1978. This will be important for later. To install the UAV in the least destructive way, I'm going to solder the socket right over the pins of the CD4050. The 
This piggybacking style, which was common for early computer RAM upgrades, allows us to leave the console mostly stuck whilst adding new functionality in. The UAV is designed to work in this configuration, or otherwise just to outright place the CD4050, as this chip mostly handles the buffering of the video signals. However, in the 2600, we need to leave this chip still connected, else the joystick buttons will not work. This is because the UAV makes its signals from the inputs, but only touches the video signal. It does not buffer or even connect to the joystick pins in the 2600 configuration. And as you can see from the schematics of the 2600, the joystick buttons go right through this chip, so, in short, a socket over the top makes for a quick and painless install. With the socket in place, here's my UAV. This unit was kindly supplied to me by Control Alt Reese for this video. Thank you, sir. If you're interested in getting a UAV for your own Atari console or computer, his store is a good place to get them from. He also has a lot of other Atari content on his channel, so go check out his store and check his channel out too. I've already soldered the pin headers and the output block in place. You can choose to solder wires to this board directly instead, but I opted to go all out. The pin headers in the middle are what set the UAV up to work in the various TIA equipped Ataris, from the 2600 all the way up to the Atari XE computer. The jumper config you see here is for the Atari 2600 when plugging into the CD4050 socket. Oh, and because the TIA's colour signal doesn't run through the CD4050, we'll need to add that in as well. Now on a PAL Revision B motherboard, that signal is here. You can also find it on pin number 9 of the TIA as well. On an NTSC unit, this information probably won't be correct. You're best to check the schematics of your revision unit or ask for some help from someone with the know-how. With the socket in place, here's my UAV. All we need to do is stick it in there. Finally, I'm going to use this janky setup for the output just to test with. Since composite is far more useful and easy for me to show, I'll be using that here. So with all that done, let's turn it on.
Well, that's not exactly as plug and play as I thought it was. Hmm. Maybe Reese is secretly sinister and sent me a faulty unit. Thankfully, I have another Atari unit, and this is the junior revision of the console. It's mostly the same, electrically speaking. And inside, sure enough, it has the same CD4050, and more importantly, the same pinouts. It also has this socket already soldered on top for easy modding. Thank you, Atari! Then it works! And Reese isn't evil. Then again, how could I ever call this guy evil? You might also notice that Pac-Man doesn't start the game immediately on this revision of 2600. More on that later. So why didn't it work on the Light Sixer? Well, this is where I think Atari screwed up. Shocking, I know. Also, this is my opinion, not necessarily fact. After a few hours of research, it occurred to me that the CD4050 has no direct connection to either 5V or reference ground. In the schematic, it does show this. In the schematics, it does show this, but the schematics make it look like this was a deliberate decision by Atari. However, the Junior and its schematic show a direct connection to the power rails. Even measuring the CD4050 voltage results in a really bad reading of 3.2 volts. That's bad for a 5V only system. With the UAV installed, that drops to a paltry 1.35V. So what gives? Well, looking at the board, it looks like it was just... forgotten. After all, this is back in the day when all PCB layouts were drawn over transparent sheets for the UV etching stage of PCB manufacturing. There was no CAD or computer-aided design back then for either PCB design, test or production, so the mistakes like this could have easily been missed. The fact that the Junior has almost the same design and has connection to the power and ground rails also adds credence to this theory. Thus, the reason the UAV isn't working is simple. It just isn't connected to power. So what do we do about it? Two wires, solder, and a smug sense of I can do better than an engineer. You'll see here that I'm adding two solid core wires that act like traces and that I'm connecting them to decent sources of power and ground. I could have wired these directly to the UAV, which some would recommend for video clarity and it would also have the same effect, but doing it this way means that the CD4050 will always have good connection to the power rails even if I remove the UAV. With those two in place, perfect. And look, Pac-Man doesn't auto-start anymore. With the CD4050 not on the board of input hysteresis anymore, Pac-Man doesn't see the CX10 button pressed at boot up, so the game doesn't auto-start. Again, I say that this is another piece of evidence that this fix is supposed to be how the console was designed and the lack of power was just a mistake. With the hardware mods to the Atari finished, now all that's left to do is to first of all connect this wire to the output of the UAV and the DuPont header in I soldered in for audio. Having the wire removable like this means I don't have to cut or unsolder the wire if I want to separate the motherboard from the case. I've seen people cut corners by soldering wires directly from point to point which usually results in me having to work around it or to cut it out and then fix it later. I'm removing the original hardwired RF cable, which just unclips and pushes out the case. Before trifitting the motherboard and switchboard just to see how I can route the new output cable to this hole. By sheer chance, the 3.5mm jack that I had in my parts bin almost perfectly fit the cutout of this hole. 
so all I needed to do was just to glue it in. With the jack in place, it's just a matter of reassembling the case now. I soon realised how the case wouldn't shut like this, so instead I routed the cable through the hole in the bottom shield. Finally I can rebuild the console. Or not, I put a screw in one of the middle shielding plate holes. <sighs> this is where the board screws to the case, so back apart again. Finally, it's reassembled for good. You can see here how the output jack is easy to get at. This position does require the use of a right angled cable, but it's hardly an inconvenience to me. So, Atari made a mistake. I mean, in all of their business choices, it's not like it's the worst mistake they've ever made. In any case, our Atari is now up to the 21st century standards and with video that has never looked so crisp.